part one chapter four of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain oh that midnight mass he had had the unfortunate idea of going to it at christmas he went to saint severin and found a young lady's day school installed there instead of the choir who with sharp voices like needles knitted the worn-out skeins of the canticles he had fled to saint sulpice and plunged into a crowd which walked and talked as if in the open air he had heard their choral society marches tea garden waltzes firework tunes and had come away in a rage it had seemed to him superfluous to try saint germain des prés for he held that church in horror besides the weariness inspired by its heavy ill-restored shell and the miserable paintings with which flandrin loaded it the clergy there were specially almost alarmingly ugly and the choir was truly infamous they were like a set of bad cooks boys who spat vinegar and elderly choir men who cooked in the furnace of their throats a sort of vocal broth a thin gruel of sound nor did he think of taking refuge in st thomas aquinas where he dreaded the barking and the choruses there was indeed st clotilde where the psalmody at least is upright and has not like that of st thomas lost all shame he went there but again encountered dance music and profane tunes a worldly orgy at last he went to bed in a rage saying to himself in paris at any rate a singular baptism of music is reserved for the newborn next day when he woke he felt he had no courage to face the churches the sacrileges of last night would he thought continue and as the weather was almost fine he went out wandered in the luxembourg gained the square of the observatoire and the boulevard de port royal and mechanically made his way along the interminable rue de la santé he knew that street of old and had taken melancholy walks in it attracted by its poor houses like those of a provincial town then it was fit for a dreamer for it was bounded on the right by the prison de la santé and saint anne's madhouse and on the left by convents light and air circulated in the street but behind it all was black it was a kind of prison corridor with cells on either side where some were condemned to temporary sentences and others of their own free will suffered lasting sorrows i can imagine thought durtal how it would have been painted by an early flemish master the long street paved by patient pencils the stories open from top to bottom and the cupboards the same and on one side massive cells with iron bedsteads a stoneware jug little peepholes in the doors secured by strong bolts inside scoundrels and thieves gnashing their teeth turning round and round their hair on end howling like caged animals on the other side little rooms furnished with a pallet bed a stoneware jug a crucifix these also closed by doors iron banded and within nuns or monks kneeling on the flags their faces clean cut against the light of a halo their eyes lifted to heaven their hands joined raised from the ground in ecstasy a pot of lilies at their side then at the back of the canvas between these two rows of houses rises a great avenue at the end of which in a dappled sky sits god the father with christ on his right choirs of seraphim playing on guitar and viol god the father immovable under his lofty tiara his breast covered by his long beard holds scales which balance exactly the holy captives expiating precisely by their penances and prayers the blasphemies of the rascals and the insane it must be admitted thought durtal that this street is very peculiar that there is probably none like it in paris for it unites in its course virtues and vices which in other quarters in spite of the efforts of the church trend apart as far as possible from each other thus thinking he had come as far as st anne's where the street grows lighter and the houses are lower with only one or two stories then gradually there is greater space between them and they are only joined to each other by blank ends of walls at any rate thought durtal if this street has no distinction it is very private here at least one need not admire the impertinent decoration of those modern shops which expose in their windows as precious commodities chosen piles of firewood and in glass sweetmeat jars coal drops and coke lollipops and here is an odd lane and he looked at an alley which led down a sharp decline into a main street where was to be seen the tricolour flag in zinc on a wash-house he read the name rue de l'ebre he entered it it was but a few yards long 
the whole of one side was occupied by a wall behind which were half seen some stunted buildings surmounted by a bell an entrance gate with a square wicket was placed in the wall which was raised higher as it sloped downwards and at the end was pierced by round windows and rose into a little building surmounted by a clock tower so low that its point did not even reach the height of the two-storied house opposite on the other side three hovels sloped down closely packed together zinc pipes ran everywhere growing like vines ramifying like the stalks of a hollow vine along the walls windows gaped on rusty leaden hinges dim courts of wretched hovels could be seen in one was a shed where some cows were reposing in two others were coach houses for wheelchairs and a rack behind the bars of which appeared the capsuled necks of bottles but this must be a church thought durtal looking at the little clock tower and the three or four round bays which seemed cut out in emery paper to look like the black rough mortar of the wall where is the entrance he found it on turning out of the alley into the rue de la glaciere a tiny porch gave access to the building he opened the door and entered a large room a sort of closed shed painted yellow with a flat ceiling with small iron beams colored gray picked out with blue and ornamented with gas jets like a wine shop at the end was a marble altar six lighted tapers and gilt ornaments candelabra full of tapers and under the tabernacle a very small monstrance which sparkled in the light of the tapers it was almost dark the panes of the windows having been crudely daubed with bands of indigo and yellowish green it was freezing the stove was not alight and the church paved like a kitchen floor had no matting or carpet durtal wrapped himself up as best he could and sat down his eyes gradually grew accustomed to the obscurity of the room and what he saw was strange in front of the choir on rows of chairs were seated human forms drowned in floods of white muslin no one stirred suddenly there entered by a side door a nun equally wrapped from head to foot in a large veil she passed along the altar stopped in the middle threw herself on the ground kissed the floor and by a sudden effort without helping herself by her arms stood upright advanced silently into the church and brushed by durtal who saw under the muslin a magnificent robe of creamy white an ivory cross at her neck at her girdle a white cord and beads she went to the entrance door and there ascended a little staircase into a gallery which commanded the church he asked himself what could be this order so sumptuously arrayed in this miserable chapel in such a district little by little the room filled choir boys in red with capes trimmed with rabbit skin lighted the candelabra went out and ushered in a priest vested in a grand cope with large flowers a priest tall and young who sat down and in a sonorous tone chanted the first antiphon of vespers suddenly durtal turned round in the gallery an harmonium accompanied the responses of voices never to be forgotten it was not a woman's voice but one having in it something of a child's voice sweetened purified sharpened and something of a man's but less harsh finer and more sustained an unsexed voice filtered through litanies bolted by prayers passed through the sieves of adoration and tears the priest still sitting chanted the first verse of the unchanging psalm dixit dominus domino meo and durtal saw in the air in the gallery tall white statues holding black books in their hands chanting slowly with eyes raised to heaven a lamp cast its light on one of these figures which for a second leant forward a little and he saw under the lifted veil a face attentive and sorrowful and very pale the verses of the vesper psalms were now sung alternately by the nuns above and by the congregation below the chapel was almost full a school of girls in white veils filled one side little girls of the middle class poorly dressed brats who played with their dolls occupied the other there were a few poor women in sabots and no men the atmosphere became extraordinary the warmth of the souls thawed the ice of the room here were not the vespers of the rich such as were celebrated on sundays at saint sulpice but the vespers of the poor domestic vespers in the plain chant of the countryside followed by the faithful with mighty fervour in silent and singular devotion durtal could fancy himself transported beyond the city to the depths of some village cloister he felt himself softened his soul rocked by the monotonous amplitude of these chants only recognizing the end of the psalms by the return of the doxology the gloria patri et filio 
which separated them from each other he had a real impulse a dim need of praying to the unknowable penetrated to the very marrow by this environment of aspiration it seemed to him that he thawed a little and took a far-off part in the united tenderness of these bright spirits he sought for a prayer and recalled what saint paphnutius taught thais when he cried thou art not worthy to name the name of god thou wilt pray only thus qui plasmasti me misereri mei thou who hast formed me have mercy on me he stammered out the humble phrase prayed not out of love or of contrition but out of disgust with himself unable to let himself go regretting that he could not love then he thought of saying the lord's prayer but stopped at the notion that this is the hardest of all prayers to pronounce when the phrases are weighed in the balance for in it we declare to god that we forgive our neighbours trespasses now how many who use these words forgive others how many catholics do not lie when they tell the all-knowing that they hate no one he was roused from these reflections by sudden silence vespers were over then the organ played again and all the voices of the nuns joined those in the choir below and in the gallery above singing the old carol unto us a child is born he listened moved by the simplicity of the strain and suddenly in a minute brutally without understanding why infamous thoughts filled his mind he resisted in disgust wished to repulse the assault of these shameful feelings and they were persistent he seemed to see before him a woman whose perverse ways had long maddened him all at once this hallucination ceased his eye was mechanically attracted towards the priest who was looking at him while speaking in a low voice to a beadle he lost his head imagining that the priest guessed his thoughts and was turning him out but this notion was so foolish that he shrugged his shoulders and more sensibly thought that men were not admitted to this convent of women and that the abbe who had seen him was sending the beadle to beg him to leave the beadle came straight to him durtal was ready to take his hat when in persuasive and gentle tones that functionary said that the procession was about to begin that it was the custom for the gentlemen to follow the blessed sacrament and that although he was the only man there the abbe thought he would not refuse to follow the procession about to start overwhelmed by this request durtal made a vague gesture in which the beadle seemed to see assent no he thought as soon as he was left alone i will not meddle with the ceremony first i know nothing about it and i should spoil it all and again i will not make a fool of myself he prepared to slip away quietly but he had no time to carry out his intention the usher brought him a lighted candle and asked him to accompany him he put the best face he could on the matter and while thinking that he was blushing all over he followed the beadle to the altar there the beadle stopped him and bid him not to move the whole congregation was now standing the girls school divided into two files preceded by a woman carrying a banner durtal came in front of the first rank of nuns their veils lowered before the profane even in church were raised before the blessed sacrament before god durtal was able to look at these sisters for a moment at first his disillusion was complete he had supposed them pale and grave like the nun he had seen in the gallery and almost all of them were red freckled crossing their poor hands swelled and wounded by chilblains their faces were puffy and all seemed at the beginning or end of a cold they were evidently country girls and the novices known by their grey robes under the white veil were still more common looking they had certainly been accustomed to farm labour and yet on seeing them all turned to the altar the poverty of their faces the ugliness of their hands blue with cold their broken nails injured in the wash disappeared their eyes modest and humble under their long lashes changed their coarse features into pious simplicity lost in prayer they did not even see his curious looks and did not even suspect a man was there examining them durtal envied the admirable wisdom of these poor girls who alone understood it was mad to wish to live he thought ignorance leads to the same result as knowledge among the carmelites are rich and pretty women who have lived in the world and left it wholly convinced of the vainness of its joys and these nuns who evidently know nothing have had an intuition of that vacuity which it has needed years of experience for the others to gain by different ways they have arrived at the same meeting-place then what clearness of thought is revealed by their entrance into an order for if indeed they had not been gathered by christ what would have become of these unhappy girls married to drunkards and hammered by beatings 
or perhaps maids in taverns ill-treated by their masters brutalized by the other servants destined to the scorn of the streets and the dangers of ill-usage and without knowing anything they have avoided it all have remained innocent far from these perils and far from this defilement under an obedience which is not ignoble disposed by their very way of life to experience should they be worthy the most powerful joys which the soul of a human creature can feel they remain perhaps beasts of burden but at any rate god's beasts of burden he had got so far in his reflections when the beadle beckoned to him the priest who had descended from the altar held the little monstrance the girl's procession was moving before him durtal passed in front of the line of nuns who did not take part in the ceremony and torch in hand he followed the beadle who carried behind the priest an open white silk parasol then the harmonium in the gallery filled the church with its drawling tones like an enlarged accordion and the nuns standing beside it intoned the old chant rhythmical as a march the adeste fideles while below the novices and the faithful repeated after each stanza the sweet chorus of invitation venite adoremus the procession went several times round the chapel above the heads bowed in the smoke from the censers which the choir boys swung turning at each pause to face the priest well after all i have not come so badly out of it said durtal to himself when they had returned to the altar he thought his part was finished but this time without asking his permission the beadle asked him to kneel at the communion rail in front of the altar he was ill at ease and annoyed at knowing that the whole school and the whole convent was behind him nor was he accustomed to kneel it seemed as if wedges were thrust into his limbs as if he were subjected to the tortures of the middle ages embarrassed by his taper which was guttering and threatened to cover him with spots he shifted his position quietly trying to make himself more comfortable by slipping the skirts of his great coat between his knees and the steps but in moving he only increased the evil his flesh was folded back between the bones and his skin was chafed and burning he sweated at last with the pain and feared to distract the fervour of the community by falling while the ceremony went on for ever the nuns sang in the gallery but he listened no more and deplored the length of the service at last the moment of benediction approached then in spite of himself seeing himself there so near to god durtal forgot his sufferings and bowed his head ashamed to be so placed like a captain at the head of his company in the first rank of this maiden troop and when in a great silence the bell tinkled and the priest turning lightly cut the air in the form of a cross and with the blessed sacrament blessed the congregation kneeling at his feet durtal remained his body bent his eyes closed seeking to hide himself to make himself small and not be seen there in front amid that pious crowd the psalm laudate dominum omnes gentes rang out when the beadle came to take his taper durtal could hardly resist a cry when he had to stand up his benumbed knees cracked and their joints would hardly work yet he regained his place somehow let the crowd pass and approaching the beadle asked him the name of the convent and the order to which the nuns belonged they are the franciscan missionaries of mary answered the man but the chapel is not theirs as you seem to think it is a chapel of ease for the parish of saint marcel de la maison blanche it is only joined by a corridor to the house those sisters occupy behind us there in the rue de l'ebre they join in the offices in fact just as you and i may do and they keep a school for the children of the district it is a touching little chapel thought durtal when he was alone it is well matched with the neighbourhood it shelters with the gloomy brook of the tanners which runs through the yards below the rue de la glaciere it gives me the effect of being to notre dame de paris what its neighbour the bievre is to the seine it is the streamlet of the church the pious pavement the miserable suburb of worship how poor and yet how exquisite are those nuns voices which seem non-sexual and mellow god knows how i hate the voice of a woman in the holy place for it still remains unclean i think woman always brings with her the lasting miasma of her indispositions and she turns the psalms sour then all the same vanity and concupiscence rise from the worldly voice and its cries of adoration accompanied by the organ are only cries of carnal desire its very pleadings in the most sombre liturgical hymns are only addressed to god from the lips outward for at bottom a woman only mourns the mediocre ideal of earthly pleasure to which she cannot attain 
thus i thoroughly understand that the church has rejected woman from her offices and that the musical robe of her sequences may not be contaminated she employs the voices of the boy and the man yet in convents of women that is changed it is certain that prayer communion abstinence and vows purify the body and the soul as well as the vocal odour which proceeds from them the emanations from them give to the voices of the nuns however crude however ill-trained they may be their chaste inflections their simple caresses of pure love they recall to it the ingenuous sounds of childhood in certain orders they seem even to prune it of the greater part of its branches and concentrate the threads of sap which remain in a few twigs and he thought of a carmelite convent to which he had gone from time to time remembering their failing almost expiring voices where the little health that remained to them was concentrated in three notes voices which had lost the musical colours of life the tints of open air keeping only in the cloister those of the costumes they seemed to reflect white and brown chaste and sombre tones ah those carmelites he thought of them now as he descended the rue de la glaciere and he called up the memory of a profession the thought of which took entire possession of him every time he meditated on convents he saw again in memory a morning in the little chapel in the avenue de saxe a chapel spanish gothic in style with narrow windows glazed with panes so dark that the light which remained in their colours did not pass through them at the end rose the high altar in shade raised on six steps on the left a large iron grating in an arch was covered with a black curtain and on the same side but almost at the base of the altar a little arch traced on the plain wall like a lancet window with an aperture in the middle a sort of square a frame without a panel empty that morning the chapel cold and dark sparkled lighted by groves of candles and the odour of incense not adulterated as in other churches by spices and gums filled it with a dull smoke it was crammed with people crouched in a corner durtal had turned round and like his neighbours looked at the backs of the thurifers and priests who were going towards the entrance the door opened suddenly and he saw in a burst of daylight a red vision of the cardinal archbishop of paris passing up the nave turning from side to side a horse-like head in front of it a big bespectacled nose bending his tall form all on one side blessing the congregation with a long twisted hand like a crab's claw he and his suite ascended the altar steps and knelt at a prie dieu then they took off his tippet and vested him in a silk chasuble with a white cross embroidered in silver and the mass began shortly before the communion the black veil was gently withdrawn behind the high grating and in a bluish light like that of the moon durtal faintly saw white phantoms gliding and stars twinking in the air and close to the grating a woman's form kneeling motionless on the ground she too holding a star at the end of a taper the woman did not move but the star shook then when the moment of communion was at hand the woman rose then disappeared and her head as if decapitated filled the square of the wicket opened in the arch then as he leant forward he saw for a second a dead face with closed lids white eyeless like ancient marble statues and all passed away as the cardinal bent above the grating with the ciborium in his hand all was so rapid that he asked himself if he were not dreaming the mass was over behind the iron grating resounded mournful psalms slow chants drawn out weeping always on the same notes wandering lights and white forms passed in the azure fluid of the incense monseigneur richard was sitting mitre on head interrogating the postulant who had returned to her place and was kneeling before him behind the grating he spoke in a low voice and could not be heard the whole congregation bent to listen to the novice as she pronounced her vows but only a long murmur was heard durtal remembered that he had elbowed his way and got near the choir where through the crossed bars of the grating he saw the woman clad in white prostrate on her face in a square of flowers while the whole convent filed past bending over her intoning the psalms for the dead and sprinkling her with holy water like a corpse it is admirable he cried moved in the street by the memory of the scene and he thought of what a life was that of these women to lie on an hair mattress without pillow or sheets to fast seven months out of the twelve except on sundays and feasts always to eat standing vegetables and abstinence fare, 
to have no fire in winter to chant for hours on ice-cold tiles to scourge the body to become so humble as however tenderly nurtured to wash up dishes with joy and attend to the meanest tasks to pray from morning to midnight even to fainting to pray there till death they must indeed pity us and set themselves to expiate the imbecility of a world which treats them as hysterical fools for it cannot even understand the joy in suffering of souls like these we cannot be proud of ourselves in thinking of the carmelites or even of those humble franciscan tertiaries who are after all more vulgar it is true that they do not belong to a contemplative order but all the same their rules are very strict their existence is so hard that they too can atone by their prayers and good works for the crimes of the city they protect he grew enthusiastic in thinking of the convents ah to be earthed up among them sheltered from the herd not to know what books appear what newspapers are printed never to know what goes on outside one's cell among men to complete the beneficent silence of this cloistered life nourishing ourselves with good actions refreshing ourselves with plain song saturating ourselves with the inexhaustible joys of the liturgies then who knows by force of good will and by ardent prayer to succeed in coming to him in entertaining him feeling him near us perhaps almost satisfied with his creature and he called up before him the joys of those abbeys in which jesus abode he remembered that astonishing convent of unterlinden near colmar where in the thirteenth century not only one or two nuns but the whole convent rose distractedly before christ with cries of joy nuns were lifted above the ground others heard the songs of seraphim and their emaciated bodies secreted balm others became transparent or were crowned with stars all these phenomena of the contemplative life were visible in that cloister a high school of mysticism thus wrapped in thought he found himself at his own door without remembering the road he had taken and as soon as he was in his room his whole soul dilated and burst forth he desired to thank to call for mercy to appeal to someone he knew not whom to complain of he knew not what all at once the need of pouring himself forth of going out of himself took shape and he fell on his knees saying to our lady have pity on me and hear me i would rather anything than continue this shaken existence these idle stages without an aim pardon me holy virgin unclean as i am for i have no courage for the battle ah wouldst thou grant my prayer i know well that i am overbold in daring to ask since i am not even resolved to turn out my soul to empty it like a bucket of filth to strike it on the bottom that the lees may trickle out and the scales fall off but but thou knowest i am so weak so little sure of myself that in truth i shrink Oh, all the same i would desire to flee away a thousand miles from paris i know not where into a cloister my god yet this is very madness that i speak for i could not stay two days in a convent nor indeed would they take me in then he thought though this once i am less dry less unclean than is my wont i can find nothing to say to our lady but insanities and follies when it would be so simple to ask her pardon to beg her to have pity on my desolate life to aid me to resist the demands of my vices not to pay as i do the royalties on my nerves the tax on my senses all the same he said rising enough of this i will at least do what little i can without more delay i will go to the abbe to-morrow i will explain the struggle of my soul and we will see what happens afterwards end of part one chapter four Part One, Chapter Five of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He was really comforted when the servant said that Monsieur L'Abbé was at home. He entered a little drawing room and waited till the priest, whom he heard speaking to someone in the next chamber, was alone. He looked at the little room and marked that nothing was changed since his last visit. It was still furnished with a velvet sofa of which the red once crimson had become the faded rose colour of raspberry jam on bread there were also two tall armchairs on either side of the chimney which was ornamented by an empire clock and some china vases filled with sand in which were stuck some dry stalks of reed in a corner against the wall under an old wooden crucifix was a prie dieu marked by the knees an oval table in the centre some sacred engravings on the walls and that was all 
it is like an hotel or an old maid's lodging thought durtal the commonness of the furniture the curtains in faded damask the panels hung with a paper covered with bouquets of poppies and field flowers in false colours were like lodgings by the month but certain details above all the scrupulous cleanliness of the room the worked cushions on the sofa the grass mats under the chairs and hortensia like a painted cauliflower placed in a flower-pot covered with lace looked on the other hand like the futile and icy room of a devout woman nothing was wanting but a cage of canaries photographs in plush frames shell work and crochet mats durtal had got so far in his reflections when the abbe came in with extended hand gently finding fault with his long absence durtal made what excuses he could unusual occupations long weariness and our blessed lidwine how did you get on with her ah i have not even begun her life i am not in a state of mind which allows me to engage in it durtal's accent of discouragement surprised the priest come what is the matter can i be of any use to you i do not know monsieur l'abbé i am almost ashamed to talk to you about such troubles and suddenly he burst out telling his sorrows in any chance words declaring the unreality of his conversion his struggles with the flesh his human respect his neglect of religious practices his aversion from the rites demanded of him in fact from all yokes the abbe listened without moving his chin on his hand you are more than forty he said when durtal was silent you have passed the age when without any impulse from thought the awakening of the flesh excites temptations you are now in that period when indecent thoughts first present themselves to the imagination before the senses are agitated we have then to fight less against your sleeping body than your mind which stimulates and vexes it on the other hand you have arrears and prizes of affection to put out you have no wife or children to receive them so that your affections being driven back by celibacy you'll end by taking them there where at first they should have been placed you try to appease your soul's hunger in chapels and as you hesitate as you have not the courage to come to a decision to break once for all with your vices you have arrived at this strange compromise to reserve your tender feeling for the church and the manifestations of that feeling for women that if i do not mistake is your correct balance sheet but good heavens you have not too much to complain of for do you not see that the important thing is to care for woman only with your bodily senses when heaven has given you grace to be no longer taken captive by thought all may be arranged with a little effort of will this is an indulgent priest thought durtal but continued the abbe you cannot always sit between two stools the moment will come when you must stick to the one and push the other away and looking at durtal who looked down without answering do you pray i do not ask if you say your morning prayers for not all those who end by entering on the divine way after wandering for years where chance might take them call on the lord so soon as they awake at break of day the soul thinks itself well thinks itself firmer and at once takes occasion of this fleeting energy to forget god it is with the soul as with the body when it is sick when night comes our sensations are stronger pain which was quieted awakes the fever which slept blazes up again filth revives and wounds bleed anew and then it thinks of the divine miracle worker it thinks of christ do you pray in the evening sometimes and yet it is very difficult the afternoon is tolerable but you say truly when the daylight goes evil spring up a whole cavalcade of obscene ideas then pass through my brain how can any one be recollected at such moments if you do not feel able to resist in the street or at home why do you not take refuge in the churches because they are closed when one has most need of them the clergy put jesus to bed at nightfall i know it but if most churches are closed there are a few which remain partly open very late ah saint sulpice is among the number and there is one which remains open every evening and where those who visit it are always sure of prayers and benediction notre dame des victoires i think you know it yes monsieur l'abbé it is ugly enough to cause tears it is pretentious it is in bad taste and the singers churn up a margarine of rancid tones i do not go there then as i go to saint severin and saint sulpice to admire there the art of the old praisers of god to listen even if they are incorrectly given to the broad familiar melodies of plain chant notre dame des victoires is worthless from the aesthetic point of view 
and yet i go there from time to time because alone in paris it has the irresistible attraction of true piety it alone preserves intact the lost soul of the time at whatever hour one goes there people are praying there prostrate in absolute silence it is full as soon as it is open and full at its closing there is a constant coming and going of pilgrims from all parts of paris arriving from the depths of the provinces and it seems that each one by the prayers that he brings adds fuel to the immense brazier of faith whose flames break out again under the smoky arches like the thousands of tapers which constantly burn and are renewed from morning till evening before our lady well i who seek the most deserted corners and the darkest places in the chapels i who hate mobs mix almost willingly with those i find there because there every one is isolated no one is concerned with his neighbour you do not see the human bodies which throng you but you feel the breath of souls around however refractory however damp you may be you end by taking fire at this contact and are astonished to find yourself all at once less vile it seems to me that the prayers which elsewhere when they leave my lips fall back to the ground exhausted and chilled spring upwards in that place are borne on by others grow warm and sore and live at saint severin i have indeed experienced the sensation of a help spreading from the pillars and running through the arches but as i think the aid is less strong perhaps since the middle ages that church makes use of but cannot renew the celestial effluvia with which it is charged while at notre dame the help which springs up from the very pavement is forever vivified by the uninterrupted presence of an ardent crowd in the one it is the impregnate stone the church itself which brings consolation in the other it is above all things the fervour of the crowds which fill it and then i have the strange impression that the virgin attracted and retained by so great faith only spends a little while in other churches goes there as a visitor but has made her home and really resides in notre dame the abbe smiled come i see that you know and love it and yet the church is not on our left bank beyond which you said to me one day there is no sanctuary worth having yes and i am surprised at it especially as it is placed in a thoroughly commercial quarter two paces from the exchange whose ignoble shouts can be heard in it it was itself an exchange said the abbe in what way after having been baptized by the monks and having served as a chapel for the discalced augustinians it was horribly desecrated in the revolution and the exchange was set up within its walls i was not aware of that detail said durtal but continued the abbe it was with it as with those holy women who if we believe their biographers recovered by a life of prayer the virginity they had formerly lost our lady washed it from its violation and though it is comparatively modern it is at the present day saturated with emanations infused by effluences of angels penetrated with divine drugs it is for sick souls what certain thermal springs are for the body people keep their season there make their novenas and obtain their cure now to come back to our point i tell you you will do wisely if on your bad evenings you will attend benediction in that church i shall be surprised if you do not come out cleansed and at peace if he have only that to offer me it is little enough thought durtal and after a disappointed silence he rejoined but monsieur l'abbé even were i to visit that sanctuary and follow the officers in other churches when temptations assail me even were i to confess and draw near the sacraments how would that advantage me i should meet as i came out the woman whose very sight inflames my senses and it would be with me as after my leaving saint severin all unnerved the very feeling of tenderness which i had in the chapel would destroy me and i should fall back into sin what do you know about it and the priest suddenly rose and took long strides through the room you have no right to speak thus for the virtue of the sacrament is formal the man who has communicated is no longer alone he is armed against others and defended against himself and crossing his arms before durtal he exclaimed to lose one's soul for the pleasure of momentary gratification what madness and since the time of your conversion does not that disgust you yes i am disgusted with myself but only after my swinish desires are satisfied if only i could gain true repentance rest assured said the abbe who sat down again you will find it and seeing that durtal shook his head remember what saint teresa said one trouble of those who are beginning is that they cannot recognize whether they have true repentance for their faults but they have it 
and the proof is their sincere resolution to serve god think of that sentence for it applies to you that repugnance to your sins which wearies you is witness to your regret and you have a desire to serve the lord since you are in fact struggling to go to him there was a moment of silence well then monsieur l'abbé what is your advice i advise you to pray in your own house in church everywhere as much as you can i do not prescribe any religious remedy i simply invite you to profit by some precepts of pious hygiene afterwards we will see durtal remained undecided discontented like those sick persons who find fault with doctors who to satisfy them prescribe only colourless drugs the priest laughed confess he said looking him in the face confess that you are saying to yourself it was not worth while to put myself out for i am no further advanced this good fellow the priest practises expectant medicine instead of cutting short my crises with energetic remedies he palters advises me to go to bed early not to catch cold oh monsieur l'abbé protested durtal yet i do not wish to treat you like a child or talk to you like a woman now attend to me the way in which your conversion has worked leaves me in no doubt whatever there has been what mysticism calls the divine touch only note this god has dispensed with human intervention even with the interference of a priest to bring you back into the road you have left for more than twenty years now we cannot reasonably suppose that the lord has acted lightly and that he will now leave his work unaccomplished he will carry it through if you put no obstacle in his way in fact you are at this moment like a block in his hands what will he do with it i do not know but since he has kept to himself the conduct of your soul let him act be patient he will explain his action trust in him he will help you be content to protest with the psalmist doce me facere voluntatem tuam quia deus meos estu i tell you again i believe in the preventive virtue the formal power of the sacraments i quite understand the system of pere milrio who obliged those persons to communicate whom he thought would afterwards fall again into sin for their only penance he obliged them to communicate again and again and he ended by purifying them with the sacred species taken in large doses it is a doctrine at once realistic and exalted but reassure yourself continued the abbe looking at durtal who seemed wearied i do not intend to experiment on you in this way on the contrary my advice is that in the state of ignorance in which we are of god's will you abstain from the sacraments for you should desire them and it should come from you rather than from him be sure that sooner or later you will thirst for penance hunger for the eucharist well when unable to restrain yourself longer you ask for pardon and entreat to be allowed to approach the holy table we shall see we will ask him what way he will choose to take in order to save you but there are not i presume several ways of confessing and communicating certainly not that is just what i meant to say but and the priest hesitated at a loss for words it is quite certain he began again that art has been the principal means which the saviour has used to make you absorb the faith he has taken you on your weak side or strong side if you like that better he has infused into your nature the chief mystical works he has persuaded and converted you less by the way of reason than the way of the senses and indeed those are the special conditions you have to take into account on the other hand your soul is not humble and simple you are a sort of sensitive whom the least imprudence the least stupidity of a confessor would at once repel therefore that you may not be at the mercy of a troublesome impression certain precautions must be taken in the state of weakness and feebleness in which you are a disagreeable face an unlucky word antipathetic surroundings a mere nothing would be enough to rout you is it not so alas sighed durtal i am obliged to answer that you are right but monsieur l'abbé i do not think i shall have to fear such disillusions if when the moment you predict has come you will allow me to make my confession to you the priest was silent for a while then said no doubt since i have met you i may probably be useful to you but i have an idea that my part will be confined to pointing out the road to you i shall be a connecting link and nothing more and you will end as you have begun without help alone the abbe remained in thought then shook his head and went on let us leave the subject however for we cannot anticipate the designs of god to sum up try to stifle in prayer your attacks of the flesh it is a less matter not to be overcome at the moment 
than to direct all your efforts not to be so then the priest added gently to rouse the spirits of durtal whom he saw to be depressed if you fall do not despair and throw the handle after the hatchet say to yourself that after all lust is not the most unpardonable of faults that it is one of two sins for which the human being pays cash and which are consequently expiated in part at least before death say to yourself that wantonness and avarice refuse all credit and will not wait and in fact whoever unlawfully commits a fleshly act is almost always punished in his lifetime for some there are bastards to provide for sickly wives low connections broken careers abominable deceptions on the part of those they have loved on whichever side we turn when women are concerned we have to suffer for she is the most powerful instrument of sorrow which god has given to man it is the same with the passion for gain every being who allows himself to be overcome by that hateful sin pays for it as a rule before his death look at the panama business cooks housekeepers small proprietors who till then had lived in peace seeking no inordinate gains no illicit profit threw themselves like madmen into that business they had one only thought to gain money the chastisement of their cupidity was as you know sudden yes said durtal laughing the de Lesseps were the agents of providence when they stole the savings of fools who had moreover got them probably by thieving in a word said the abbe i repeat my last advice do not be at all discouraged if you sink do not despise yourself too much have the courage to enter a church afterwards or the devil catches you by cowardice the false shame the false humility he suggests nourish maintain solidify your wantonness in some measure well no good-bye come and see me soon again durtal found himself in the street a little confused it is evident he murmured as he stalked along that the abbe gévresin is a clever spiritual watchmaker he has dexterously taken to pieces the movement of my passions and made the hours of idleness and weariness strike but after all his advice comes only to this stew in your own juice and wait indeed he is right if i had come to the point i should not have gone to him to chatter but really to confess what is strange is that he does not at all seem to think he will have to put me through the wash-tub and to whom does he mean me to go to the first comer who will wind about me his spool of commonplaces and stroke me with his big hands without seeing clearly well well what's the time he looked at his watch six o'clock and i do not care to go home what shall i do till dinner he was near saint sulpice he went in and sat down to clear his thoughts a little taking a place in the chapel of our lady which at that hour was almost empty he felt no wish to pray and rested there looking at the great arch of marble and gold like a scene in a theatre where the virgin the only figure in the light advances towards the faithful as from a decorated grotto on plaster clouds meanwhile two little sisters of the poor came and knelt not far from him and meditated their heads between their hands he thought as he looked at them those souls are to be envied who can thus be abstracted in prayer how do they manage it for in fact it is not easy if one thinks of the sorrows of the world to praise the vaunted mercy of god it is all very fine to believe that he exists to be certain that he is good in fact we do not know him we are ignorant of him he is and in fact he can only be immanent permanent and inaccessible he is we know not what and at most we know what he is not try to imagine him and the senses fail for he is above about and in each one of us he is three and he is one he is each and he is all he is without beginning and he will be without end he is above all and forever incomprehensible if we try to picture him to ourselves and give him a human wrappage we come back to the simple conception of the early times we represent him under the features of an ancestor some old italian model some old father turgenov with a long beard and we cannot but smile so childish is the likeness of god the father he is in fact so absolutely above the imagination and the senses that he comes only nominally into prayer and the impulses of humanity ascend especially to the son who only can be addressed because he became man and is to us somewhat of an elder brother because having wept in human form we think he will hear us more readily and be more compassionate to our sorrows as to the third person he is even more disconcerting than the first he is especially the unknowable how can we imagine this god formless and bodiless this substance equal to the two others who as it were breathe him forth 
we think of him as a brightness a fluid a breath we cannot even lend to him as to the father the face of a man since on the two occasions that he took to himself a body he showed himself under the likeness of a dove and of tongues of fire and these two different aspects do not help to a suggestion of the new appearance he might assume certainly the trinity is terrible and makes the brain reel Riesbroek has moreover said admirably let those who would know and study what god is know that it is forbidden they will go mad so he continued looking at the two little sisters who were now telling their beads these good women are right not to try to understand and to confine themselves to praying with all their heart to the mother and the son moreover in all the lives of the saints which they have read they have made certain that jesus and mary always appeared to the elect to console and strengthen them in fact how stupid i am to pray to the son is to pray to the two others for in praying to one among them i pray at the same time to the three since the three make but one and the substances are however special because if the divine essence is one and simple it is so in the threefold distinction of the persons but again what is the use of fathoming the impenetrable yet he continued remembering the interview he had just had with the priest how will all this end if the abbe be right i no longer belong to myself i am about to enter the unknown which frightens me if only the sound of my vices consents to be silent but i feel that they rise furiously within me ah oh, that florence and he thought of a woman to whose vagaries he was riveted continues to walk about in my brain i see her behind the lowered curtain of my eyes and when i think of her i am a terrible coward he endeavoured once more to put her away but his will was overcome at the sight of her he hated despised and even cursed her but the madness of his illusions excited him he left her disgusted with her and with himself he swore that he would never see her again but did not keep his resolve he saw her now in vision extend her hand to him he recoiled struggling to free himself but his dream continued mingling her with the form of one of the sisters whose gentle profile he saw suddenly he started returned to the real world and saw that he was at saint sulpice in the chapel it is disgusting that i should come here to soil the church with my horrible dreams i had better go he went out in confusion thinking perhaps if i visit florence once again i may perhaps put an end to this haunting sense of her presence seeing and knowing the reality and he was obliged to answer himself that he was becoming idiotic for he knew by experience that past desire grows in proportion as it is nourished no the abbe was right i have to become and to remain penitent but how pray how can i pray when evil imaginations pursue me even in church evil dreams followed me to la glaciere here they appear again and smite me to the ground how can i defend myself for indeed it is frightful to be thus alone to know nothing and to have no proof to feel the prayers which one tears out of oneself fall into the silence and the void without a gesture to answer without a word of encouragement without a sign i do not even know if he be there and if he listens the abbe tells me to wait an indication an order from on high but alas they come to me from below end of part one chapter five Part One, Chapter Six of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Many months passed. Durtal continued his alternation of wanton and pious ideas. Without power to resist, he saw himself slipping. All this is far from clear, he cried one day in a rage, when, less apathetic than usual, he forced himself to take stock now monsieur l'abbé what does this mean whenever my sensual obsessions are weaker so also are my religious impressions that means said the priest that your adversary is holding out to you the most treacherous of his baits he seeks to persuade you that you will never attain to anything unless you will give yourself up to the most repugnant excesses he tries to convince you that satiety and disgust of these acts alone will bring you back to god he incites you to commit them that they may so to speak bring about your deliverance he leads you into sin under pretext of delivering you from it have a little energy despise these sophistries and resist him he went to see the abbe gevresin every week 
he liked the patient discretion of the old priest who let him talk when he was in a confidential humour listened to him carefully manifested no surprise at his frequent temptations and his falls only the abbe always returned to his first advice insisted on regular prayer and that durtal should each day if possible visit a church he also now said the hour is important for the success of these practices if you wish that the chapels should be favourable to you get up in time to be present at daybreak at the first mass the servants mass and also be very often in the sanctuaries at nightfall the priest had evidently formed a plan durtal did not yet wholly understand it but he was bound to admit that this discipline of temporizing this constant call to thought always directed to god by his daily visits to the churches acted upon him at last and little by little softened his soul one fact proved it that he who for so long a time had been unable to meditate in the morning now prayed as soon as he awoke even in the afternoon he found himself on some days seized with the need of speaking humbly with god with an irresistible desire to ask his pardon and implore his help it seemed then that the lord knocked at his door with gentle touches wishing so to recall his attention and draw him to him but when softened and troubled durtal would enter into himself to seek god he wandered vaguely not knowing what he said and thinking of other things while speaking to him he complained of these wanderings and distractions to the priest who answered you are on the threshold of the probationary life you cannot yet experience the sweet and familiar friendship of prayer do not sadden yourself because you cannot close behind you the gate of your senses watch and wait pray badly if you can do nothing else but pray all the same be very sure too that every one has experienced the troubles which distress you above all believe that we do not walk blindfold that mysticism is an absolutely exact science it can foretell the greater part of the phenomena which occur in that soul which the lord intends for a perfect life it follows also spiritual operations with the same clearness as physiology observes the different states of the body for ages and ages it has disclosed the progress of grace and its effects now impetuous and now slow it has even pointed out the modifications of material organs which are transformed when the soul entirely loses itself in god saint denis the areopagite saint bonaventure hugh and richard of saint victor saint thomas aquinas saint bernard reisbroek angela of foligno the two eckharts tauler suso denis the carthusian saint hildegard saint catherine of genoa saint catherine of siena saint magdalene of pazzi saint gertrude and others have set forth in a masterly way the principles and theories of mysticism and it has found at last an admirable psychologist to sum up its rules and their exceptions a saint who has verified in her own person the supernatural phases she has described a woman whose lucidity was more than human saint teresa you have read her life and her castles of the soul durtal nodded assent then you have your information you ought to know that before reaching the shores of blessedness before arriving at the fifth dwelling of the interior castle at that prayer of union wherein the soul is awakened in regard to god and completely asleep to all things of earth and to herself she must pass through lamentable states of dryness and the most painful strainings take heart therefore say to yourself that this dryness should be a source of humility and not a cause of disquietude do in fact as saint teresa would have you carry your cross and not drag it after you that magnificent and terrible saint frightens me sighed durtal i have read her works and you know she gives me the idea of a stainless lily but a metallic lily forged of wrought iron you will admit that those who suffer have scant consolations to expect from her yes in the sense that she does not think of the creature except in the way of mysticism she supposes the fields already ploughed the soul already freed from its more vehement temptations and sheltered from crises her starting point is as yet too high and too distant for you for in fact she is addressing nuns women of the cloister beings who live apart from the world and who are consequently already advanced on those ascetic ways wherein god is leading them but make an effort in the spirit to free yourself from this mud cast away for a few moments the memory of your imperfections and your troubles and follow her see then how experienced she is in the domain of the supernatural 
how in spite of her repetitions and tediousness she explains wisely and clearly the mechanism of the soul unfolding when god touches it in subjects where words fail and phrases crumble away she succeeds in making herself understood in showing making felt almost making visible the inconceivable sight of god buried in the soul and taking his pleasure there and she goes still further into the mystery even to the end bounds with a final spring to the very gates of heaven but then she faints on adoration and being unable to express herself further she soars describing circles like a frightened bird wandering beyond herself in cries of love yes monsieur l'abbé i recognize that saint teresa has explored deeper than any other the unknown regions of the soul she is in some measure its geographer has drawn the map of its poles marked the latitudes of contemplation the interior lands of the human sky other saints have explored them before her but they have not left us so methodical nor so exact a topography but in spite of this i prefer those mystical writers who have less self-analysis and discuss less who always do throughout their works what saint teresa did at the end of hers that is who are all on fire from the first page to the last and are consumed and lost at the feet of christ reisbroek is among these the little volume which hello has translated is a very furnace and again to quote a woman take saint angela of foligno not so much in the book of her visions which may not be always effectual as in the wonderful life which she dictated to brother armand her confessor she too explains and much earlier than saint teresa the principles and effects of mysticism but if she is less profound less clever in defining shades on the other hand she is wonderfully effusive and tender she caresses the soul she is a bacchant of divine love a maenad of purity christ loves her holds long conversations with her the words she has retained surpass all literature and are manifestly the most beautiful ever written this is no longer the rough christ the spanish christ who begins by trampling on his creature to make him more supple he is the merciful christ of the gospels the gentle christ of saint francis and i like the christ of the franciscans better than the christ of the carmelites what will you say then said the abbe with a smile of saint john of the cross you compared saint teresa just now to a flower in wrought iron he too is such but he is the lily of tortures the royal flower which the executioners were wont of old time to stamp on the heraldic flesh of convicts like red-hot iron he is at the same time burning and sombre as you turn over the pages saint teresa now and then bends over and sorrows and compassionates us he remains impenetrable buried in his internal abyss occupied above all things in describing the sufferings of the soul which after having crucified its desires passes through the night obscure that is to say through the renunciation of all which comes from the sensible and the created he wills that we should extinguish our imagination so lethargize it that it can no longer form images imprison our senses annihilate our faculties he wills that he who desires to unite himself to god should place himself under an exhausted receiver and make a vacuum within so that if he choose the pilgrim should descend therein and purify himself tearing out the remains of sins extirpating the last relics of vice then the sufferings which the soul endures overpass the bounds of the possible it lies lost in utter darkness falls under discouragement and fatigue believes itself forever abandoned by him to whom it cries who now hides himself and answers not again happy still when in that agony the pangs of the flesh are not added and that abominable spirit which isaias calls the spirit of confusion and which is none other than the disease of scrupulousness pushed to its extreme saint john makes you shudder when he cries out that this night of the soul is bitter and terrible and that the being who suffers it is plunged alive into hell but when the old man is purged out when he is scraped at every seam raked over every face light springs out and god appears then the soul casts itself like a child into his arms and the incomprehensible fusion takes place you see st john penetrates more deeply than others into the depths of mystical initiation he also like st teresa and reisbruck treats of the spiritual marriage of the influx of grace and its gifts but he first dared to describe minutely the dolorous phases which till then had been but hinted at with trembling then if he is an admirable theologian he is also a rigorous and clear-sighted saint he has not those weaknesses which are natural to a woman 
he does not lose himself in digressions nor return continually on his own steps he walks straight forward but you often see him at the end of the road blood-stained and terrible with dry eyes but but said durtal surely not all souls whom christ will lead in the ways of mysticism are tried thus yes almost always more or less i will confess that i thought the spiritual life was less arid and less complex i imagined that by leading a pure life praying one's best and communicating one would attain without much trouble not indeed to taste the infinite joys reserved for the saints but at last to possess the lord and live at least near him at rest and i should be quite content with this middle-class joy the price paid in advance for the exaltation described by st john disconcerts me the abbe smiled but made no answer but do you know that if it be so replied durtal we are very far from the catholicism that is taught us it is so practical so benign so gentle in comparison with mysticism it is made for lukewarm souls that is to say for almost all the pious souls which are about us it lives in a moderate atmosphere without too great suffering or too much joy it only can be assimilated by the masses and the priests are right to present it thus since otherwise the faithful would cease to understand it or would take flight in alarm but if god judge that a moderate religion is amply sufficient for the masses believe that he demands the most painful efforts on the part of those whom he deigns to initiate into the supremely adorable mysteries of his person it is necessary and just that he should mortify them before allowing them to taste the essential intoxication of union with him in fact the end of mysticism is to render visible sensible almost palpable the god who remains silent and hidden from all and to throw us into his deep into the silent abyss of joy but in order to speak correctly we must forget the ordinary use of expressions which have been degraded in order to describe this mysterious love we are obliged to draw our comparisons from human acts and to inflict on the lord the shame of our words we have to employ such terms as union marriage wedding feast but it is impossible to speak of the inexpressible and with the baseness of our language declare the ineffable immersion of the soul in god the fact is murmured durtal but to return to saint teresa she too interrupted the abbe has treated of this night obscure which terrifies you but she only speaks of it in a few lines she calls it the soul's agony a sadness so bitter that she strove in vain to depict it no doubt but i prefer her to st john of the cross for she is not so discouraging as that inflexible saint admit that he belongs too much to the land of those large christs who bleed in caverns of what nationality then was saint teresa yes i know she was a spaniard but so complex so strange that race seems obliterated in her less clearly defined it is clear she was an admirable psychologist but also how strange is in her the mixture of an ardent mystic and a cool woman of business for in fact she has a double nature she is a contemplative outside the world and at the same time a statesman a female colbert of the cloister in fact never was woman so consummate a skilled artisan and so powerful an organizer when we consider that in spite of incredible difficulties she founded thirty-two nunneries and she put them all under obedience to a rule which is a model of wisdom a rule which foresees and rectifies the most ignored mistakes of the heart it is astonishing to hear her treated by strong-minded people as an hysterical madwoman one of the distinctive marks of the mystics answered the abbe with a smile is just their absolute balance their entire common sense these conversations cheered durtal they planted on him seeds of reflection which sprang up when he was alone they encouraged him to trust to the advice of this priest and follow his counsels he found himself all the better for this conduct in that his visits to the churches his prayers and readings occupied his objectless life and he was no longer wearied i have at least gained peaceable evenings and quiet nights he said to himself he knew the soothing help of a pious evening he visited saint sulpice at those times when under the dull gleam of the lamps the pillars opened out and threw long panels of darkness on the ground the chapels which remained open were in shade and in the nave before the high altar a single cluster of lamps above in the darkness shone out like a luminous bunch of red roses in the stillness no sounds were heard but the dull thud of a door the creaking of a chair the short paces of a woman 
the hurried stride of a man durtal was almost isolated in the obscure chapel which he had chosen he kept himself there so far from all so far from the city whose full pulse was beating only two paces from him he knelt down and remained still he prepared to speak and had nothing to say felt himself carried away by an impulse but no words came he ended by falling into a vague languor experiencing that indolent ease that dim sense of comfort which the body feels in a medicated bath he fell a-dreaming of the lot of the women who were round about him here and there in chairs ah those poor little black shawls those miserable pleated caps those wretched tippets those doleful seed rosaries they fingered in the shade some in mourning sobbed still inconsolable others overwhelmed bent their backs and hung their heads on one side others prayed their shoulders shaking their head in their hands the task of the day was over those wearied of their life came to ask for mercy everywhere misfortune was kneeling for the rich the healthy the happy hardly pray all around in the church were women widowed or old without love women deserted women whose home was a torture praying that existence might become more merciful that the dissoluteness of their husbands might cease the vices of their sons amend the health of those they loved grow stronger a lamentable perfume went up like incense to our lady from a very sheaf of woes few men came to this hidden meeting-place of trouble still fewer young people for these have not yet suffered enough there were only a few old men and a few sick who dragged themselves along by the backs of the chairs and a little hunchback whom durtal saw coming there every evening an outcast who could only be loved by her who does not even see the body a burning pity seized on durtal at the sight of those unhappy ones who came to beg from heaven a little of the love refused them by men and he who could not pray on his own account ended by joining himself to their pleadings and praying for them so indifferent in the afternoon the churches were truly persuasive truly sweet in the evening they seemed to bestir themselves at nightfall and to compassionate in their solitude the sufferings of those sick creatures whose complaints they heard and their first mass in the morning the mass of working women and servant maids was no less touching there were there no bigots nor curious persons but poor women who came to seek in communion strength to live their hours of onerous tasks and servile needs they knew as they left the church that they were the living custodians of a god of him who was ever while on earth the poor man who took pleasure only in souls who had scarce where to lay their head they knew themselves his chosen and did not doubt that when he entrusted to them under the form of bread the memorial of his suffering he demanded of them in exchange that they should live in sorrow and humility and what harm then could do to them the cares of a day spent in the salutary shame of base occupations i now understand thought durtal why the abbe made such a point of my seeing the churches early or late those are in fact the only times in which the soul expands but he was too idle to be often present at early mass he was content to take his relaxation after dinner in the chapels he came out with a feeling of peace even if he had prayed badly or not prayed at all on other evenings on the contrary he felt tired of solitude tired of silence tired of darkness and then he abandoned saint sulpice and went to notre dame des victoires in this well-lighted sanctuary there was no longer that depression that despair of poor wretches who dragged themselves to the nearest church and sat down in the shade the pilgrims to notre dame des victoires brought a surer confidence and that faith softened their sorrows whose bitterness was dissipated in the explosions of hope the stammering adoration which spouted up all around there were two currents in that refuge that of people who asked for favours and that of those who having gained them were profuse in thankfulness and in acts of gratitude therefore that church had its especial physiognomy more joyous than sad less melancholy more ardent under all circumstances than that of other churches it had moreover the peculiarity of being much frequented by men but less by hypocrites who will not look you in the face or with upturned eyes than by men of all classes whose features were not degraded by false piety there alone were to be seen clear expressions and clean faces there above all was not that horrible grimace of the working man of the catholic clubs that hideous creature in a blouse whose breath belies the ill-defined unction of his features in that church covered with ex votos 
plastered even above the arches with inscriptions on marble celebrating the joy for prayers granted and benefits received before that altar of our lady where hundreds of tapers pierced the air blue with incense with the gilded blades of their lances there were public prayers every evening at eight a priest in the pulpit said the rosary sometimes the litany of our lady was sung to a singular air a sort of musical cento but it was impossible to say whence it was constructed very rhythmical and continually changing its tone now fast now slow bringing with it for a moment a vague recollection of seventeenth-century airs then turning sharply at a tangent to a barrel-organ tune a modern almost vulgar melody yet after all there was something taking in this singular confusion of sounds after the kyrie eleison and the opening invocations the virgin came upon the scene to a dance measure like a ballet girl but when certain of her attributes were paraded and certain of her symbolical names declared the music became singularly respectful it became lower halting and solemn thrice repeating on the same motive some of her attributes the refugium peccatorum among others then it went on again and began her graces again with a skip when by chance there was no sermon the benediction took place immediately afterwards then with raspings of the choir a bass with a cold and two boys who snivelled began their liturgical chants in violata that languishing and plaintive sequence with its clear and drawling tune so weak so frail that it would seem as if it should only be sung by voices in a hospital then the parque domine that antiphon so suppliant and so sad lastly that scrap detached from the panga lingua the tanto mergo humble and thoughtful attentive and slow when the organ sounded out the first chords and that plain chant melody began the choir had only to cross their arms and hold their tongues as tapers which are lighted by threads of fulminate attached one to the other the faithful caught fire and accompanied by the organs struck up for themselves the humble and glorious strains they were then kneeling on the chairs prostrate on the pavement and when after the exchange of antiphons and responses after the oremus the priest ascended to the altar his shoulders and hands enfolded in the white silk scarf to take the monstrance then at the shrill and hurried sounds of the bells a wind passed which at once bent every head like the mowing of grass in these groups of souls on fire there was a fullness of devotion a complete and absolute silence till the bells again rang out and invited human life which had been interrupted to wrap itself in a great sign of the cross and resume its course the laudate was not ended when durtal left the church before the crowd began to move verily he said as he entered his lodgings the fervour of that congregation who do not come as in other churches from the districts but are pilgrims from everywhere and one knows not where is out of tune with the blackguardism of this foolish age then at notre dame at least one hears curious singing and he bethought himself of those strange litanies which he had heard nowhere else and yet he had experienced all kinds in churches at saint sulpice for example it was recited to two tunes when the choir sang it was set to a plain chant melody bellowed by the gong of a bass to which the sharp fife of the boys made answer but during rosary month on every day except thursday the task of singing it was entrusted to young ladies then in the evening round a wheezy old harmonium a troop of young and old geese made our lady run round on her litanies as on hobby horses to the music of a fair in other churches at st thomas aquinas for example where they were also dropped out by women the litanies were sprinkled with powder and perfumed by bergamo and ambergris they were in fact adapted to a minuet tune and therefore did not disagree with the operatic architecture of the church where they presented a virgin walking with mincing steps pinching her petticoat with two fingers bending in beautiful curtsies and recovering herself with a fine bow this has evidently nothing to do with church music but it was none the less disagreeable to hear it would have made the whole performance complete if the harpsichord had been substituted for the organ far more interesting than this lay quavering was the plain chant given more or less badly as it was moreover given but yet given when there was no special ceremony at notre dame it was not arranged there as at saint sulpice and the other churches where the tantum ergo is almost always dressed up in foolish flourishes tunes for military ceremonials or public dinners the church has not allowed the actual text of st thomas aquinas to be altered but she has let any and every choir master suppress the plain chant in which it has been wrapped from its birth which has penetrated to its marrow has clung to each of its phrases 
and become with it one body and one soul it was monstrous and it must really be that these cures have lost not the sense of art for that they never had but the most elementary sense of the liturgy to accept such heresies and tolerate such outrages in their churches these thoughts enraged durtal but he returned little by little to notre dame des victoires and grew calmer it was well he should examine it under all aspects but it remained none the less mysterious nor the less unique in paris at la salette at lourdes there have been apparitions whether these have been authentic or controverted matters little he thought for even supposing our lady were not there at the moment her coming was announced she was attracted there and dwells there now retained there by the tide of prayer and the emanations cast up by the faith of crowds miracles have happened there it is therefore not astonishing that pious crowds flock thither but here at notre dame des victoires has been no apparition no melanie no bernadette have seen and described the luminous appearance of a beautiful lady there are no piscinas no medical staff no public cures no mountain top no grotto nothing one fine day in eighteen thirty six the cure of the paris the abbe du friche des genettes declared that while he was celebrating mass our lady manifested to him her desire that the sanctuary should be specially consecrated to her and that alone was enough the church then a desert has never since been empty and thousands of ex-votos declare the graces which since that day the madonna has accorded to the visitors yes but in fact concluded durtal all these suppliants are not specially extraordinary souls for indeed the most part of them are like me they come in their own interests for themselves and not for her and he remembered the answer of the abbe gevresin to whom he had already made the observation you must be singularly far advanced on the road to perfection if you go there for her only suddenly after so many hours spent in the chapels there was a reaction the flesh extinguished under the cinders of prayers took fire and the conflagration springing up from below became terrible florence seemed present to durtal's imagination at his lodgings in the churches in the street everywhere and he was constantly on the watch against her recurrent attractions the weather was mixed up with it all the heaven broke up a stormy summer raged shattering the nerves enfeebling the will letting the awakened troop of vices loose in their gloomy moisture durtal blenched before the dread of long evenings and the abominable melancholy of days that never ended at eight o'clock in the evening the sun had not set and at three in the morning it seemed to wake again the week was only one uninterrupted day and life was never arrested oppressed by the ignominy of this angry sunshine and these blue skies disgusted at bathing in niles of sweat and feeling niagara's run from his hat he did not stir from home and then in his solitude foul thoughts assailed him it was an obsession by thought by vision in all ways and the haunting was all the more terrible that it was so special that it never turned aside but concentrated itself always on the same point the face and figure of florence durtal resisted then in distraction took to flight tried to tire himself out by long walks and to divert his mind by excursions but the ignoble desire followed him in his course sat before him in the cafe came between his eyes and the newspaper he strove to read becoming ever more definite he ended after hours of struggle by giving way and going to see this woman he left her overwhelmed half dead with disgust and shame almost in tears nor did he thus find any solace in his struggle but the contrary far from escaping it the hateful charm took more violent and tenacious possession of him then durtal thought of and accepted a strange compromise to visit another woman he knew and in her society to break this nervous state to put an end to this possession this weariness and remorse and in doing so he strove to persuade himself that in thus acting he would be more pardonable less sinful the clearest result of this attempt was to bring back the memory of florence and her vicious charm he continued therefore his intimacy with her and then he had during a few days such a revolt from his slavery that he extricated himself from the sewer and stood on firm ground he succeeded in recovering and pulling himself together and he loathed himself during this crisis he had somewhat neglected the abbe gevresin to whom he dared not avow his foulness but since certain indications warned him of new attacks he took fright and went to see him he explained his crises in veiled words and he felt so unnerved so sad that tears stood in his eyes 
well are you now certain that you have that repentance which you assure me you have not experienced up to this time yes but what is the good of it if one is so weak that in spite of all efforts one is certain to be overthrown at the first assault that is another question come i see that at present you are in fact in a state of fatigue requiring help comfort yourself therefore go in peace and sin less the greater part of your temptations will be remitted you you can if you choose bear the remainder only take care if you fall henceforward you will be without excuse and i do not answer for it that instead of mending your condition will not be aggravated and as durtal stupefied stammered out you believe i believe said the priest in the mystical substitution of which i spoke to you you will moreover experience it in yourself the saints will enter into the lists to help you they will take the overplus of the assaults which you cannot conquer without even knowing your name from their secluded province nunneries of carmelites and poor clares will pray for you on receiving a letter from me and in fact from that very day the most acute attacks ceased did he owe that cessation that truce to the intercession of the cloistered orders or to a change in the weather which then took place to the less heat of the sun which gave way to floods of rain he could not tell but one thing was certain his temptations were less frequent and he could bear them with impunity this idea of convents in their compassion dragging him out of the mud in which he had stuck and by their charity bringing him to the bank excited him he chose to go to the avenue de saxe to pray in the home of the sisters of those who suffered for him this time there were no lights no crowds as on the morning when he had been present at a procession no odour of wax or incense no sweeping by of robes of scarlet and cope of gold all was deserted and dark he was there alone in the sombre and dank chapel smelling like stagnant water and without saying rosaries mechanically or repeating prayers by rote he fell into a reverie endeavouring to look somewhat clearly into his life and take stock of himself and while he thus pulled himself together far-off voices came behind the grating drew nearer and nearer passed by the black sieve of the veil and dropped round the altar whose form rose dimly in the shadow these voices of the carmelites aided durtal to probe his despair deeply seated in a chair he said to himself when any one is as incapable as i am when i speak to him it is almost shameful to dare to pray for indeed if i think of him it is that i may ask for a little happiness and that is foolish in the immediate shipwreck of human reason wishing to explain the terrible enigma of the meaning of life one only idea comes to the surface in the midst of the wreckage of thoughts which sink the idea of an expiation felt rather than understood the idea that the sole end assigned to life is sorrow every one has a sum of physical and moral suffering to pay and whoever does not settle it here below defrays it after death happiness is only lent and must be repaid its very phantoms are like duties paid in advance on a future succession of sorrows who knows in that case whether anaesthetics which suppress corporal pain do not bring into debt those who use them who knows whether chloroform is not a means of revolt and if the shrinking of the creature from suffering is not seditious a rebellion against the will of heaven if this be so the arrears of torture the balance of distress the warrants of pain avoided must accumulate terrible interest above and justify the war cry of saint teresa lord let me always suffer or die this explains why in their trials the saints rejoice and pray the lord not to spare them for they know that the purifying amount of ills must be paid in order to be free from debt after death to be just human nature would be too ignoble without pain for it alone can raise the soul while purifying it but all that is nothing less than consoling he added what an accompaniment to these sad thoughts are the wailing voices of these nuns it is truly frightful he ended by fleeing and taking refuge to shake off his depression in the neighbouring convent at the bottom of the allee de saxe in a suburban lane full of little cottages with gardens in front where serpentine paths of pebbles wound round tufts of pot herbs this was the convent of the poor clares of the ave maria an order still more strict than that of the carmelites poorer less fashionable more humble this cloister was entered by a little door partly ajar you ascended to the second story without meeting any one and found a little chapel through whose windows trees were visible rocking to the chirping of riotous sparrows this too was a place of burial but no longer as though opposite a tomb at the bottom of a dark cavern 
but rather a cemetery where birds sang in the sun among the branches you might have thought yourself in the country twenty miles from paris the decoration of this bright chapel tried however to be gloomy it was like those wine shops whose walls are made to look like those of caves with false stones painted in the imitation plaster only the height of the nave manifested the childishness of the imposture and declared the vulgarity of the deception at the end was an altar above a smooth waxed floor and on either side of it a grating with a black veil according to the rule of st francis all the ornaments the crucifix the candlesticks the tabernacle were of wood no object was to be seen in metal no flower the only luxury in the chapel consisted of two modern stained windows one of which represented st francis the other st clare durtal thought the sanctuary airy and delightful but he only stayed there a few minutes for there was not here as at the carmelites an absolute solitude a sombre peace here there were always two or three poor clares trotting about the chapel who looked at him while they were arranging the chairs and seemed surprised at his presence they were annoying to him and he feared he was the same to them so much so that he went away but this short stay was enough to efface or at least to lessen the funereal impression of the neighbouring convent durtal returned home at once much appeased and much disquieted much appeased in regard to his temptations much disquieted about what he should do next he felt rising in him and increasing ever more and more the desire to have done with these strifes and fears but he grew pale when he thought of reversing his life once for all but if he still had hesitation and fear he had no longer the firm intention of resisting he now accepted in principle the idea of a change of existence only he tried to retard the day and put off the hour he tried to gain time then like people who grow angry at having to wait on other days he wished to put off the inevitable moment no longer and cried within himself that this must end anything rather than remain as he was then as this desire did not seem heard he grew discouraged would no longer think of anything regretted the time past and deplored that he felt himself carried along by such a current and when he was rather more cheerful he tried again to examine himself in fact i do not at all know how i stand he thought this flux and reflux of different wishes alarms me but how have i come to this point and what is the matter with me what he felt since he became more lucid was so intangible so indefinite and yet so continuous that he was obliged to give up understanding it indeed every time he tried to examine his soul a curtain of mist arose and hid from him the unseen and silent approach of he knew not what the only impression which he carried with him as he rose was that it was less that he advanced towards the unknown but that this unknown invaded him penetrated him and little by little took possession of him when he spoke to the abbe of this state at once cowardly and resigned imploring and fearful the priest only smiled busy yourself in prayer and bow down your back he said one day but i am tired of bending my back and of trampling always on the same spot cried durtal i have had enough of feeling myself taken by the shoulders and led i know not where it is really time that in one way or another this situation came to an end plainly and standing up and looking him in the face the abbe said impressively this advance towards god which you find so obscure and so slow is on the contrary so luminous and so rapid that it astonishes me only as you yourself do not move you do not take account of the swiftness with which you were borne along before long you will be ripe and then without need to shake the tree you will fall off of yourself the question we have now to answer is into what receptacle we must put you when at last you fall away from your life end of part one chapter six